Well, hey, welcome to First Church. So glad you are joining us. If you're new, my name's Chad. Welcome, and it looks like we have a great crowd here on site. And I looked, and we've got some people joining us online as well, like Philip in Tulsa, Thomas in Ulaga, Christy in Owasso, and a whole bunch of others. So if you are here on site, would you get loud, put your hands together, welcome in our online family. Glad that they are joining us today. Glad you guys are here as well. And today is Super Bowl Sunday, and hopefully you guys are excited about that. My team didn't make it to the Super Bowl, but that's all right. I still enjoy watching the big game every single year, and hopefully you guys have some plans to watch it as well. And I love sports in general. I especially love football, but sometimes I like to watch things that happen off the field, or at least when the ball isn't in play. And I came across a video just the other day where they had mic'd up some NFL players. And if you know what this is, they put a microphone on these players. You can hear what they're saying like on the sidelines or like I said, when the ball's dead or whatever. And so I thought I would show with you, show you some of those funny clips. And I just want to let you know, I had to be really, really careful with which clips I showed. But take a look at this video. I'm mic'd up, I'm mic'd up. Hey, don't say nothing you don't want your mama to hear. Don't say nothing you don't want your mama to hear. Hey, don't say nothing you don't want your mama to hear. Chill out, I'm mic'd up. Huh? I think that boy just asked me for my jersey during the middle of the game. <laughs> boy. That's why I got this home. I'm telling you. <laughs> that was crazy. My life flashed before my eyes. You're really a heat-seeking missile. Which one do you like? Because I like, I like the one that you think will get us a touchdown. <laughs> oh, five, six, you gonna take me out? You gonna take me out? You give me more hugs than my girlfriend give me. Come on, man. A bug just flew into my mouth. That was disgusting. That right there is why I make sure I turn my mic off as soon as I leave stage, because I don't want anybody to hear something I don't want them to hear, okay? But you know, I love the Super Bowl every year, and I always like to ask our church family who they're cheering for, because I want to know who's around me, you know, who you guys are for. And so let's take a quick poll. You guys know the two teams by now that are going to be in the game tonight, Kansas City Chiefs, Philadelphia Eagles. And so I just want to hear you. This is your chance to shout out, scream, holler, clap, whatever you want to do. Let me know who you're for in the game tonight. So let's start with the Eagles here. How many Eagles fans do we have? All right. More than what I thought, actually. Okay, cool. Thank you guys for cheering out. Okay. And how many Kansas City Chiefs fans do we have? Yeah, a lot more for sure. Now, I noticed that there were some people that didn't cheer at all, and so we probably need one more category, and that's the I don't really care category. How many guys are in the yeah? Man, there's a lot of I don't care, probably more than the Eagles fans, but yeah. It's great. But isn't that an interesting statement? I don't really care. You know, there are some questions that were asked in life that are just fun questions where it's okay to respond. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter what I choose. You know, there's some decisions we're faced with. Well, it really doesn't matter if we choose our side or, or not. I mean, our lives are not going to be drastically changed depending on how we answer, such as who we pick for the Super Bowl. I mean, no matter who we pick, our lives are not going to be forever changed because of who we pick. Probably not. There's not going to be some life-changing consequences to who we cheer for in the Super Bowl. However, there are some questions in life that do result in life-changing consequences. There are some decisions that we're faced with in life that will impact us for days, months, sometimes even years to come, sometimes for our entire lives. And what we're doing in this series, Base Camp, is we're looking at some fundamental questions of our faith, and we're trying to answer them from a biblical perspective to make sure that we understand what God wants us to know on a foundational level so that our faith can continue to grow and we can continue to go where God wants us to go. Because if we're not building on a solid foundation, if we don't understand the basics of our faith, then what we're building is eventually going to fall apart. We need a firm and secure foundation. And today we are going to talk about 
what's probably the most important question you will ever have to answer or I will ever have to answer. And it's a question that Jesus asked his first followers, his first disciples some 2,000 years ago. And Jesus asked it in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus asked, who do you say I am? In other words, who am I? Who do you believe me to be? Now, in Jesus' day, there are a lot of different answers to that question. There were people in Jesus' day who would have said, well, Jesus is a prophet sent from God. Others would have said, well, Jesus is a good moral teacher or a good moral philosopher. Others would have said he's a famous rabbi. So others would have just said, well, he's a pretty good guy who does some good stuff for people. Others would have said he's a heretic or an infidel. Still others would have said he's a political revolutionary. There are a lot of different answers that people would have given, even in Jesus' day, when asked the question, who is Jesus? But the only acceptable answer that Jesus said we could have is the one that Peter gave in this same passage. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the only acceptable answer to that question is that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one sent from God to rescue us, but that he is also the son of the living God. In other words, he is God in flesh. And if that statement is true, and I just wanna let you know my heart. I'm not trying to fool anybody or pretend to be something I'm not. I'm just gonna let you know my heart. I believe this is true. And our church believes this is true. We're not gonna hide that fact. But if this is true, then it changes everything. And if it's not true, then we have no reason for being here today. If it's not true, then Christianity is meaningless. It's either true or it's not, and there really is no middle ground because you can't claim to be the son of God and then still be considered a good moral teacher by some. You can't claim to be the Messiah, the Christ, and say, oh yeah, but you know, Jesus is still worth following even though that's not true. He either is who he claimed to be or he's not. C.S. Lewis famously put it this way. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. If Jesus isn't the son of God and yet he claimed to be, he's either a lunatic, a liar, or the greatest con artist that have, has ever lived in history. But if he is who he claimed to be, it changes everything. So let me ask you the question, who is Jesus? Because that's the question that we're gonna tackle in week two of our series. See, we're calling our series Base Camp, and in case you weren't with us last weekend, a base camp is a central gathering site, a checkpoint where basic food supplies and other essentials are kept for a journey. I'm not really into mountain climbing. I say I'm not really into it. I'm not into it at all. I've never even tried to climb a mountain, but I've been told that if you wanna tackle like Mount Everest, you don't just go straight to the top. You don't go straight to the peak. If you just go straight to the top, then you will die. And that's why there are these things called base camps on both sides of Mount Everest, where you can stop and you can get the essential essential uh, resources, the essential tools that you need in order to keep going. You can take a rest and make sure that you are prepared for the rest of the journey. And that's what this series is for us. We are taking intentional time to look and make sure that we have what we need to keep going, that we are building our lives on the essential truths of Christianity because we believe God has a destination he wants us to reach. We believe that God has greater plans, a greater purpose in store for us, and he wants to continue to use us in greater ways. But in order for that to happen, we have to, we have to make sure we're building our lives on what he believes is important. And so we're looking today at the question, who is Jesus? Because I don't believe there is a more important question that we could possibly ask, and here's why. 
Our faith is only as strong as the one in whom our faith is placed. Our faith is only as strong, is only as powerful as the one in whom our faith is placed. And what's interesting is there are a whole lot of people in our culture today who claim to like Jesus, but they find certain parts of Jesus problematic. Because Jesus taught a lot of things that were considered controversial both in his day and in ours today as well. Jesus said a lot of things that went against the grain of conventional wisdom and it made people feel really, really uncomfortable. For example, Jesus said things like, the first will be last and the last will be first. We don't like to hear that. Jesus taught things like turn the other cheek or pray for your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. We don't want to hear stuff like that. We don't want to hear love those who oppose you. I mean, who wants to hear teachings like that? Forgive as God has forgiven you. Or what about go the extra mile for somebody who doesn't deserve it? We don't want to hear stuff like that. Jesus said you've got to give up your life in order to gain life. What's that all about? But out of all the statements that Jesus made, probably the most controversial is the one that he made about himself in John 14, verse 6. Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way to God, to heaven. I am the way. I am the truth, meaning I am the embodiment of truth. I am the life, meaning if you really want to live, life is found in me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, Jesus says. And then Jesus goes on to say, in case you didn't get it, in case you missed it, in case I need to be more clear, in case you're not picking up what I'm putting down, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's a very definitive statement. And Jesus taught this in other places, and the New Testament writers teach this as well. But this is about as plain as you can get, as clear as you can get. And notice what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, I am a way to God, or I'm one of the ways to God, or I know the best way to God. That's not what he said. He said, I am the way. And a lot of people find that problematic. A lot of people have trouble with that statement because they see it as being intolerant. They see it as too exclusive. They see it as unloving. They see it as narrow-minded. And all that is true if that statement isn't true. If he isn't the way, the truth, and the life. But if it is true, then it's the most loving news we could ever receive. And that's what I want to talk about today. See, the reason why we don't shy away from this teaching is we're not a church, church that just tells people what they want to hear. Some churches do that. And some churches, they dance around the hard topics. We're, we don't do that here. We teach what we believe God wants us to teach. And so we address the hard topics, and I'm going to try to do that today. But if you're not on the same page with me, that's okay. That's what the sermon is all about. I want to have a conversation with you about this. And the reason why we're going to have this conversation is for this very reason. Jesus' claim to be the way isn't a problem to avoid, but it's a promise that needs to be shared. It's not a problem that we avoid, but it's a promise that we share. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. In order to do that, let's talk about why some people struggle with Jesus. Let's talk about some of the problems that people have with Jesus. And first, I'm convinced that many people struggle with Jesus is a matter of perception. Because some see Jesus' claims as too intolerant or narrow-minded. I just mentioned this a second ago. We live in a world today where 
A lot of people believe the myth that all religious roads lead to God, that all religions lead to the same heaven, that all dogs go to heaven, basically. I mean, that's what a lot of people hold. And that sounds good on the surface. It really does. It sounds very inclusive, and it sounds nice, and it sounds comforting, unless it isn't true. See, truth excludes that which is contrary. And I believe that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus isn't trying to exclude anyone because he gives this invitation to follow him as the way to everyone. And he's making this statement out of love. Let me illustrate it like this. Several, or at the end of the year, Many of you guys know my wife went to the hospital and she was there for an extended period of time and she was taken, uh, she was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance and I didn't get to ride with her in the ambulance, they wouldn't let me, so I had to follow in my car. And so when we got to the hospital in Tulsa, I parked my car and I went to the first elevator I could find. I knew she was gonna be in ICU and my mind was everywhere. You know, I wasn't really thinking straight, uh, but I went to this elevator and I got on and I didn't even hit a button. I just kind of like stood there waiting for the elevator to take me where I wanted to go. And there was somebody else on the elevator, a worker there at the hospital, really nice guy. And he looked at me and he said, uh, sir, what floor? And I said, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to this floor, I see you. And he goes, um, I see you, you can't get there on this elevator. I was like, what do you mean? Isn't it on this floor? And he said, yeah, it's on that floor, but you need to get on a different elevator. This elevator is part of a different tower, and so it won't take you to ICU. You've got to walk on through the hospital, go to the other elevator, and take it to ICU. And let me just ask you, when this man told me that on the elevator, do you think that I looked at him and said, this is ridiculous. Why in the world are you telling me to take another elevator? I'm in a hurry. This elevator is gonna take me where I want to go. Do you think I did that? Of course not. Do you think I looked at him and I said, who designed this place? I wanna talk to the person who designed this place. This was a dumb decision to make an elevator that doesn't go to every place that I need to get to in this hospital. Do you think that's what I did? No. I looked at him and I said, thank you, because I need to get to my wife. And I went to the other side of the hospital, took that elevator to get to my wife. By that man looking at me and saying, oh, this elevator won't get you where you need to go. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't being unloving. He wasn't being intolerant or narrow-minded. He was trying to help me out. He was being loving because he knew the way to where I needed to go. And the same is true when it comes to Jesus. When Jesus looks at us and says, I am the way to God, he's not being mean. What he's saying is, you're headed down the wrong path. The path that you're on leads to destruction. You're on the wrong elevator. The elevator you're on can't get you to where you need to go. So I'm telling you, take this way, my way, because I can get you to the Father. I can get you to where you need to go. And sometimes when we're on the wrong path, we don't even realize it because the path we're on seems right. And that's why the Bible gives us this warning in the book of Proverbs. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. We could be headed down the path of destruction and not know it. And the myth that so many people believe that all religious roads lead to God, to the same God, it sounds good unless it's not true. And by the way, that statement, all religious roads lead to the same God, can't be true. You know why? Because Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through him. So that statement alone lets us know the Christian religion, the Christian faith, I hate to call Christianity a religion, but you know what I'm saying, the Christian faith, the Christian faith is incompatible with all other faiths. It doesn't mean that we don't love people who disagree with us. It doesn't mean that we are hateful towards people or anything like that. But we know the way, and so our job is to show everybody else the way. Because the way of Jesus is open to everyone. And if there was another way outside of Jesus, let me ask you, what would be the point of the cross? Do you remember when Jesus prayed in the garden? On the night he was arrested, Father, if there's any other way, 
let this cup pass for me. Let this suffering pass for me. And Jesus still had to go to the cross because it was the only way to save the human race. What type of cruel, mean, sick God would send Jesus to the cross if there was some other way for us to be saved? It was the only way. And we didn't have a plan to save ourselves. And even if we had the plan, we didn't have the man to do it. We didn't have the perfect sacrifice to do it. God found a way. And that way came through Jesus. And by Jesus telling us this way, it's not narrow-minded. It's loving. And the United States Constitution allows for protection of all religious beliefs. And I think that's a good thing. But equal protection under the law is not the same as them all being equally true. We have to figure out what is true. Let me tell you why I believe Jesus is true. There are a lot of different reasons, actually, I could list. And there's a lot of biblical evidence and historical evidence that we could look at. We talk about, I don't have time for all that. Let me just give you the biggest piece of evidence. The piece of evidence that our faith hinges upon. The piece of evidence that is the foundation of everything that we do. And that is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then this is all a farce. But if Jesus did defeat the grave, then he is exactly who he claims to be. Paul says this. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, and if Christ has never been raised, then the message we tell is worth nothing. And your faith is worth nothing. Let me ask, why do you think guys like Paul, who at one time were persecuting the church, then turned around and started preaching about Jesus in the streets publicly, is because Jesus was alive and Paul knew it. He had seen Jesus for himself on the road to Damascus and he knew Jesus defeated the grave. And therefore, he was willing to risk his life to tell everyone the way to God. See, you don't risk your life for somebody you know to be a lunatic. You don't risk your life for someone you know is lying. You don't risk your life for a con artist. But when you meet the one who walked out of the tomb, you give your entire life to him because he is the only way to life. And there are multiple historical accounts that we could reference that actually back up what the Bible says, that Jesus was crucified and yet Jesus was seen alive after his death. Lee Strobel, you may recognize his name. He was a reporter, a investigative and legal reporter for the Chicago Tribune for 14 years, as well as other media outlets. And he was a professed atheist who thought that Christianity was foolish, thought the idea of God was foolish, didn't buy any of it until he took on the assignment to investigate Jesus for himself from a historical perspective. It's not like he started opening his Bible. He went to history and he looked at the facts and he put on his investigative reporter lenses and he studied Jesus from a secular perspective, from the historical accounts that we have of Jesus. And let me show you what he found. Here's his conclusion. My journalistic skepticism toward the supernatural had melted in light of the breathtaking historical evidence that the resurrection of Jesus was a real historical event. In fact, my mind could not conjure up a single explanation that fit the evidence of history, nearly as well as the conclusion that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. The atheism I had embraced for so long buckled under the weight of historical truth. And Lee Strobel, who was an atheist for years, became a follower of Jesus. He studied Jesus for two years and later converted to Christianity. And if you're at the point now where you're skeptical about Jesus, that's okay. This is a safe place for you to come and learn about him. We're fine with you being skeptical. Jesus is not afraid of your questions. And I encourage you to investigate him, both 
from a biblical perspective. And if you want to look at history, you can read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. He lays out a lot of that historical evidence that he mentioned in that quote there. He's got some other books too, The Case for Faith and The Case for the Resurrection. He's got a lot of good material to present all this historical evidence. We want to study alongside you because we believe that the Jesus of the Bible stands up to the Jesus of history. And Jesus, from a historical perspective, from eyewitness testimony, from a biblical perspective, is alive. And the more you study about Jesus, the more you will find this. The resurrection appearances of Jesus are as well authenticated as anything in antiquity. There can be no rational doubt that they occurred. And I agree with Michael Green as I have studied it for myself. See, that's why I'm convinced that the same disciples who ran and fled on the night that Jesus was arrested were the same disciples who later were preaching in the streets about Jesus. See, think about it. The same guys who ran for their lives and hid because they wanted to save their own skin, the same Peter who denied Jesus publicly three times are the same guys who just a little bit later are standing before the Sanhedrin, the same governing body that arrested Jesus and they're boldly declaring there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. What changed? Why did they go from guys who were trying to save their own skin, hiding on the night that Jesus was arrested, publicly denying him to men who stood before the very men who had Jesus arrested and later executed and say, we believe Jesus is alive and there is no other way to God but through him. It's because they had seen him alive. And when you see the risen Lord, it changes everything. Again, you don't die for a lunatic or a liar or a con artist, but you'll give everything for the one who holds the keys of death in Hades. But you see, the disciples, they didn't just see him alive. They understood why he had to rise from the dead. And that leads me to the next struggle that some people have with Jesus. They misunderstand the idea of relationship, the relationship that God wants to have with us. Some see the way to God as mechanical rather than relational. What do I mean by that? In the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says this. It says, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. In other words, inside of all of us is this God-shaped hole. We are all longing for a relationship with God. You may not know what that desire is that you feel occasionally, but that desire, that longing for something more, that longing for something outside this world, that longing that says there's more than just what you see around you, that's that longing for God that's been placed within you because we were created to live in relationship with him. And so what the human race has tried to do over and over again is they've tried to create ways to reach out to God because we know we need this relationship with God. And so That's what the world religions offer. They offer a way to reach out to God, but Christianity is different from all other faith systems in our world because Christianity isn't about us reaching out to God. It's about God reaching out to us. See, when Jesus came on the scene, God in flesh, he said, there's nothing you can do to earn your way to God, to earn your way to heaven because we're all sinners. We've all corrupted this life that God gave us and God is a holy God and he can't have anything to do with corruption. We have corrupted this life that he has given us and there's no amount of good things we can do to reach out to him, to try to get to him, to achieve status with him because we've already corrupted this life that God has given us and sometimes people think, well, if I just do enough good works, then I can be good enough for God but It's kind of like I remember a few years ago at a Christmas gathering of my family, my uncle was there and he was doing something really odd. He would keep uh, eating like a sweet, like a brownie or a cookie or a piece of cake, whatever. And then he would, after he'd eat it, he would eat a carrot. So he would eat a cookie, then a carrot, a brownie, then a carrot, a piece of cake, then a carrot. Like, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to cancel the other out. It doesn't work like that, does it? You can eat a carrot, but a carrot doesn't cancel out a brownie, does it? It just doesn't work like that. And... The same thing is true with sin. You can try to do all these good works and good works are fine, but they don't cancel out 
The sin that we've already committed because the corruption is already there. And even if good works could do that, which they can't, don't misunderstand me, but even if good works, if we could do enough good works to cancel out all the bad that we have done, how would we ever know that we have done enough good to be good enough? It's kind of like if you had a boss who said, hey, you better meet your sales quota this next quarter, and if you don't meet your sales quota, then you're fired, but then your boss never tells you your sales quota. You think you're gonna sleep well at night not knowing? Of course not, because you're never gonna know for sure if you have done enough in order to keep your job. See, all other religions offer you the statement, I hope so, I hope you do enough, in order to get to God. I hope so. That's all they can offer you. Jesus says you can know so. He came so that we could know the Father and we could know that we are his children and we could know that we have eternal life. I heard this quote one time. All other religious beliefs are spelled D-O. They are focused on people doing something to somehow earn their way to God while Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E because it's based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. So are good works bad? No, God wants us to do good works. But the reason why we do them is different from other religious practices. We don't do good works to earn our way to God. We do good works as a response for what God has done for us. God has given us new life in his grace. And because he has given us this gift of new life, we are now his children. And in response to his love and his care and his provision and his guidance, his grace, we then live for him. And that's the last reason why I think a lot of people struggle with Jesus. They don't always wanna live for him. They struggle with the issue of authority. Some people don't want to surrender control of their lives. Our world is full of people who like Jesus as Savior. They want somebody to come and rescue them. But they don't necessarily want him all the time as, his Lord, as their Lord. There's a difference between Savior and Lord. And Jesus wants for us to make him both Savior and Lord of our lives. Just like little kids who don't want to be told what to do, sometimes we just don't want even God to tell us what to do. We don't want Jesus to tell us what to do. And so we try to figure out life on our own. And we just do whatever we want to do, hoping that in the end everything will work out. But here's the thing. When you chase after happiness by this world standards, it's like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. You can try. You can force it in there. But it just doesn't work. And so the God-shaped hole inside your soul stays empty. Only Jesus can fill that hole. And that's why we put our trust in him because he is uniquely qualified to give us the life that we're looking for. That's why Jesus says in John 10, 10, I came to give life, life in all its fullness. You wanna live a full life? You wanna live a complete life? You wanna live a whole life? Do life with Jesus. That's why in that statement that we looked at earlier from John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You wanna really live? Life is found in me. And he, as God in flesh, is uniquely qualified with the right credentials to show us what life is really all about. I don't know if you've seen these Sling TV commercials, but basically there's this guy who's trying to cut down a tree. He doesn't hire a professional and the tree falls on his house. And so his family and neighbors are standing there and they're like, what are we gonna do now? And about that time, an Uber Eats driver pulls up and he gets out of his car and he says, I got this. And they're just like, are you a contractor? No, but I've watched a lot of home improvement TV. And so he says, I've watched a lot of home improvement shows on TV. And he starts telling them what to do. And they're like, we're not listening to this guy. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. Or how about this example right here? Like this flight attendant who says, is there anybody on the plane while the plane's in the air? who knows how to fly an airplane. And you've got this guy who's dressed like a pilot and he raises his hand, but this other dude beside him cuts in front of him. And he's like, I got this. They're just like, are you 
a pilot? It's like, no, but I've seen a lot of pilots on TV, you know, and then he goes to the cockpit and everybody's like, this guy has no idea what he's doing. Do you want that guy flying your plane? Do you want the other guy working on your home? Of course not, because they're not qualified to do so. Listen, you don't want me flying your plane. You don't want me even working on your house for that matter, because I'm not qualified to do so. You want to find somebody who has the right credentials to do what they need to do for you. And Jesus is uniquely qualified to show us life, to give us life, because he's the creator of life. No one else created life but him. And not only is he the creator of life, he's the only one who ever defeated death. Listen, I'm not gonna listen to somebody else who says they know a better way than Jesus when they ended up in the grave and they stayed in the grave. I'm not going to listen to somebody else who says that they know a better way than Jesus, but one day they're going to die and they're going to stay in the grave. I'm going to listen to the one who has the power over death and who is still alive and is reigning on the throne. That's who I'm going to listen to. And so, I'm not bothered by the fact that Jesus says, I'm the only way. That doesn't bother me. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not upset that he made that statement. Because some Christians, I think, feel like, I wish he hadn't been, been so exclusive and say something like that. No, I'm not. I don't feel that way. I'm not bothered by it. I am grateful for it. Because I'm grateful that God provided a way back to him. Because without Jesus, there is no way. Without Jesus, we couldn't save ourselves. And even like I said, if we had the plan, we didn't have the man to do it. We didn't have the perfect sacrifice who could stand in our place. We couldn't save ourselves. So I'm not upset that Jesus made that statement. I'm grateful that God provided a way for me and you to get to him through Jesus. And that's why we're here. Because it's not an exclusive statement. The statement, I'm the way, the truth, and the life is for all people everywhere. And so what that means is it's the most inclusive invitation that's ever been offered. Everybody is welcome to follow Jesus as the way to God. And so as the church, we are here to let everyone everywhere know that they can get to where they were created to go, and that's life with their Father. And we have a great opportunity as a church here in just a little bit to let people know about who Jesus is. We can let people know about Jesus all the time, but you guys know that Easter Sunday is a day when a lot of people come to church that normally don't, and it's a chance for us to show them who Jesus really is on that day. So we wanna take advantage of this opportunity And so we're going to have Easter services here like we always do, but we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to add two more services to the two services we already have on Sunday morning. It's the first time in our history we've ever offered four services on a Sunday morning. In past Easter's, we've added one service. It's the first time that we're going to add two. And we're going to have an 8 a.m. service, a 9.30 service, a 11 o'clock service, and a 12.30 service. This is the first time we're announcing this. But we want to go and give you plenty of time because Easter will be here before you know it. To one, be inviting people. Invite your neighbors, invite your coworkers, invite your family, invite your teammates, whoever. Invite them to come to one of these services and go with them. But also we're asking you who typically come here, call church, first church or home, to intentionally, if you can, come to either the 8 a.m. or the 12.30 p.m. service because those are the odd services and we need to make room for our guests in these services. And you may say, yeah, but that's a little bit you know, awkward and different or whatever. It's really a small sacrifice if you give up your seat so somebody else can come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I'm gonna challenge you now to start thinking about that. If you can't come to one of those services, come to the one you can come to. Don't misunderstand me. But if you can, make that sacrifice so that we can tell as many people as possible about Jesus. And we need all four of these services. With the crowds that we're having right now on a normal Sunday, on Easter, we need these four services in order to tell as many people as we possibly can about Jesus. Guys, I'm not upset that Jesus made the statement, I'm the only way. 
I'm just grateful that he is the way to God and that all of us, you and me, have been invited to come with him. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for today and I thank you for this moment we've had to open up your word and study it and I just pray that we would continue to look to your son as the way, the truth, and the life. May we continue to follow him all of our days and show as many people as we possibly can the life that he offers the world. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.